I was in the room in Cleveland last August as Megyn Kelly refined the presidential debate question that rocked the campaign and made her a constant target of Donald Trump's taunts. Now, the anchor's long-awaited interview with Trump is airing Tuesday night at 8 Eastern on the Fox Broadcast Network in her first primetime special. Here's a preview. You seem to stay angry for months. Yeah. Was that real or was that strategy? Well, I'm a real person. I don't say, oh, gee, I'm angry tonight, but tomorrow you're my best friend. See, I do, I do have a theory that, you know, when somebody does it, and this could happen again with us. I mean, it could be uh, even doing this particular interview. I have great respect for you that you were able to call me and say, let's get together and let's talk. To me, I would not have done that. I sat down with her for a wide-ranging conversation in the Kelly File studio in New York. Megan Kelly, welcome. Hi. How hard has it been over the last nine months as Donald Trump threw these insults that you called you crazy not to fire back? At times it's been difficult. I'm not going to lie. Uh, there were certainly times where I would have liked to have come out and said something, but I knew that that was not in my best interest and I knew that that was not my role. You know, he kept trying to put me on the playing field and I kept trying to pull myself off. I think the truth is it was much harder for my husband not to say something than it was for me not to say anything. Yeah, to restrain him. Uh, as you became part of the sort of ongoing Trump story, and then he blew off the Fox debate in Iowa, and then guests would say, well, as you know, Megan, but you didn't take the bait. Uh, all that must have been uncomfortable. It's definitely been awkward. There's no question about it. And, it. and it remains awkward. I mean, I had a moment just the other day on the air when I had the Trump spokesperson, Katrina Pearson, who I like a lot, because Trump and Hillary were going back and forth on language about women and she took the position Katrina did that you know he's never really said anything about a woman that he wouldn't say about a man and you know I could see it coming at me like a freight train I knew I knew what what word was blinking over both of our heads and it's a situation where I can't not raise it because it was said about me um, but I don't want I don't want to actively raise it because it was said about me so I've tried to walk that line when you asked Donald Trump for the meeting in Trump Tower, uh, you both said afterwards it cleared the air. It was like two diplomats trying to preserve a midi ceasefire. <laughs> <laughs> what was the meeting like? I was nervous before I went over there that morning. You know, I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I certainly woke up and thought, this is, this is an odd day, and I don't know what's going to happen here. But as soon as I saw him and received a very gracious welcome from him, I knew it, we'd be fine. You know, I knew that it was going to be that kind of a meeting and not a contentious adversarial one. Once the interview was announced, there was this media chatter. Megan's got to wipe the floor with him. Megan's got to dismember him. What did you make of that? I thought they were missing the point of what was going to happen. You know, I mean, Trump and I have already had very contentious exchanges and what I call the Olympic level of questioning, you know, at those debates. I don't think anybody would accuse me of giving any politician a pass in my interviews. And, but this is a different setting and it's a different kind of thing. You know, I, I don't feel any need to go in there and try to take down Trump, nor did I at those debates. That wasn't my goal at the debates either. M my goal here is to have an interesting, compelling exchange with him. And I did. And I think the audience is going to feel that way too. So when we see it on Tuesday, you say interesting, compelling. I mean, was it contentious? Was it awkward at times? Yes, it was. I would say overall it was cordial, but there were definitely some tense moments and some awkward moments and moments similar to what I just said. There, there were some moments where you could see where this conversation was going. There was no way around it. And there we were eye to eye talking about some of the most awkward moments of this campaign. What was in it for Donald Trump to sit down with you finally? I think many things. Um, I think Trump could have gone on and on the way he had been. I don't think he was looking necessarily actively to resolve this or make it stop. I don't think Trump minds acrimony or controversy. You think? <laughs> yeah, right. That's, it's not that insightful. But I do. Uh, I don't like that. I, didn't, I certainly didn't like being part of the story. And I, I don't like acrimony, um, which is odd that I've chosen a job in cable news primetime. But in any event, that's, that's for another day. Um, so I guess... I think he saw that he was headed for a possible contested convention at that point because it was just before he secured the nomination sure. and a general election and realized this might be a good time to perhaps bury the hatchet on his end and perhaps we could show the world that two people who had been mired in this very difficult circumstance could come together 
and have an affable exchange, you know, affable at least in its tone. I'm sure you've gone over this in your mind, but when you look back at that first debate in Cleveland. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account. Only Rosie several... O'Donnell. For the record, it was well beyond Rosie O'Donnell. Yes, I'm sure it was. Could you or should you have worded that question about women differently? No. I wouldn't change one thing about that question, not for a minute. Everyone on this network is acutely aware, and perhaps you most of all, that Trump's campaign has divided the Fox audience with a lot of passion on both sides. Have you tried to put that out of your mind as you go about doing your show, doing your job? Yes. I mean, I can't, you know, my boss, our boss, Roger Ailes, has always told me, don't go chasing an audience. And so you can't program your show that way. You know, who will I bring in? Who will I alienate? It just, it leads to compromised journalistic choices. So my goal for the past year has been to live up to that promise I made in the only statement I've made publicly about the Trump attacks, which was that I would continue to cover him without fear or favor. And I understood the risks of that, because if you really do cover Trump that way, he does tend to attack you, especially if your name is Megyn Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I understood that some of his voters, some of his fans, and some of our viewers might not like that. And certainly I heard from them. And I understand that. They love him. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to win. They didn't want anybody, least of all a journalist, getting in the way or doing anything or offering coverage that might not reflect well on him or might impede his path. But that's for them to worry about. My job is to worry about something very different, which is, you know, maintaining my integrity, maintaining the Big J journalism job that I've been given, and, you know, pressing forward on the, on the truth. And I feel I've been faithful to that. You told People Magazine that during this turmoil you experienced a lot of hate. That was the word you used. And some of that must have been pretty ugly. You know, it's, there's no question it's been a difficult year. How much good does it do to sit and wallow in it? Not much. I'm, I'm not that kind of person. But, yes, uh, it's, I'm also honest. So it's, it's been difficult. It's been dark. I've also had a lot of silver linings. You know, it's brought my husband and me much closer. We were close to begin with, but we've been in the bunker together. Oh, that's interesting. With our three kids, and I, I feel closer feel to like than I ever have. There was a huge storm around you, and you were holding on to each other's support to some degree. Yes, and you know, when when you, when the you know what hits the fan, you figure out acutely what's most important to you. And I'm somebody who's always worried, as you know, about my own mortality, given my father's death at an early age. So I worry about it anyway. But this put a special point on it, just reminding me what a short time we're here for, Howie, and what really matters. And the things that matter most to me are in my apartment in New York City, my husband and my three kids, and to a larger extent, my friends and my extended family. And I have been surrounded by them and their love for the past nine months in an extra special way. More now of my conversation with Megyn Kelly as we turn from the Trump uproar to the price of fame. Now, the whole Trump controversy and fallout um, has undoubtedly made you more famous. You've been on the cover of the New York Times magazine, cover of Vanity Fair, cover of Variety. That, two of those happened prior to Trump. Okay. To the extent that it has raised your profile, do you enjoy that kind of limelight? No, I, I don't. I can't answer that yes in the way you phrased it, because certainly it was very exciting to see myself on the cover of Vanity Fair. That happened after Trump. That, that's never been offered to me before. I mean, I'm sure that was connected to the whole dust up. So that was crazy. You know, it's like I saw myself at a newsstand next to a cover of Oprah, who is one of my idols. And I thought, wow, what a, what a thing, you know. But my goal in getting into news was never to be famous. Um, and in fact, there are significant downsides to fame. You know, I'm, listen, I'm not going to be a Justin Bieber. <laughs> right? I have a great life. I was going to ask you because, and I can ask this of anybody in TV who's achieved a certain success, does fame and money, is there a risk that it uh, distances you from the audience? I don't think so. I think there's a, there's a risk it corrupts you as a person and then that distances you from the audience. But, you know, I think my viewers know I'm exactly the same person as I've always been. Let me tell you, so I have a book coming out in the fall. In this book, I introduce you to my mother. You, when you get to know Linda Kelly through this book, you will realize I will never change. One of the reasons I ask, though, is that a lot of our colleagues in the news business, many of them live in New York or Washington, travel in certain social circles, completely underestimated the Trump phenomenon and the way in which uh, he connected with the anger out there among many ordinary Americans. No question about it. 
I mean, Trump hijacked the Republican Party, and it's been a spectacular spectacle, uh, you know, to behold. I mean, it's really just been amazing. I think w what happened this past year is the Republican Party elders did their level best to bring the voters to heel. And what happened instead was the Republican Party voters brought the party to heel and said, no more. This time we tell you what we want. And they got their way. They've been heard now. I think that's actually good for the Republican Party. Whether Trump can get that ball across the finish line, time will tell. Some viewers may not know that you were a practicing lawyer, that you quit, that you took a job as a rookie reporter with the ABC station in Washington and later hired at the Fox Washington Bureau. What possessed you to do that? Well, I, you know, smacked headfirst into the brick wall of unhappiness. <laughs> that, that wall of uh, right? a wake-up call. And I realized, oh man, this is just not as much fun as I thought it would be. To your question earlier about whether money will, will change you, that kind of thing. I had plenty of money when I was practicing law, and I said, this sucks. I, I'm not happy. You know, my, my closest friend at the time was a nurse. She was making 30 grand a year working in Boston. She was making no money, but she was happy. We'd go, we'd have a couple of, you know, 50 cent beers at her local bar, and we'd have a great time. For me, it was in part a wake-up call that all this money and all these raises and all these bonuses and these accolades and great reviews I was getting weren't worth it. I, I wasn't happy. So it dawned on me that just because you're good at something doesn't mean it makes you happy and I resolved to change my life and and in that moment my old friend Dr. Phil's saying dawned on me which was the only difference between you and someone you envy is you settled for less and my promise to myself was that I would settle for more so I did so I worked to get a different kind of job that I would love and I wound up taking a job that paid seventeen thousand dollars a year pays a lot more now but, that's good. To hear that. but I earned it I don't I, I do not begrudge myself that because I earned it I didn't come from a family with money you know we went to the town park growing up we took one vacation which was down to Orlando in the family truckster um, so I earned everything I have and I still feel connected to the life that surrounded me as I grew up I can relate you're talking to a kid from Brooklyn Megan great to see you thanks for being here good to see you Howie and you can catch Megyn Kelly Presents. It doesn't just involve Trump, but other guests like Michael Douglas on the Fox Broadcast Network Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern.